Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillah. Wassalatu wassalamu ala sayyidina rasulillah. Wa ala alihi wa sahbatihi wa man wala. We praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We send peace and blessings upon our beloved messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Upon his family, his companions, and those who follow them until the end of time. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Everybody, hope everyone's doing well. Uh, I want to thank, first of all, the community for coming out, alhamdulillah, uh, post-COVID excitement, as we can see, alhamdulillah, uh, in great numbers and supporting uh, the great work. And then Miftah, who years ago, uh, Mufti Sahib, you know, took me in Detroit for this ride and showed me uh, their vision, the vision of your late brother, Allah, yarham, mashallah. Uh, and, and it's great to see the work they're doing, and I want to encourage you to enroll, subscribe, uh, and support them uh, in their endeavors. The topic that I was given was standing alone, and I understood this to be in the context of the Quran. So I'm going to talk about a few issues. You may need to take some notes. As he said, I'm old now, so I speak a little different than I did when I was young. So just be ready. Um, but taking uh, uh, this seriously, we have to appreciate the virtues uh, and importance of having a relationship with the Qur'an. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam from Sayyidina Uthman ibn Affan, we all know this famous hadith, Khayrukum man ta'alam al-Qur'an wa allama. You know, the best of you are those who learn and teach the Qur'an. The best human beings. And uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam, he said, inna lillahi ahlin, like Allah has chosen friends, and they ask him, who are they? He said, Ahlullah, Ahlul Qur'an wa khasatuhu. The people of Allah are the people of the Qur'an. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alludes to the virtues of the Qur'an in numerous places, in the Qur'an itself. Inna hadha al-Qur'an yahdi lillati hi aqwa. The Qur'an guides to what's upright. It's going to lead us to what's best. So there are like numerous virtues. Uh, our teacher from West Africa, when we were very young, and we memorized the Quran, he used to read this poem, أَفْضَرُ مَا يُتْلَى وَمَا يُقَارُ وَخِرُ مَا يُنْفِقُ فِيهِ مَارُ قِرَاتُ الْقُرْآنِ عِنْدَ النَّاسِ كَذَا رَوَى أَئِمَّةُ الْقِيَاسِ لَيْسِ رَى عَلَى أَرْضِ كَمِثْلِهِ سَبْعِينَ يَشْفَعُ مِنْ أَهْرِ وَلَا يُسْأَلُ وَلَا يُحَاسَبُ أَهْلُ رِوَايَ جَمِيعًا قَالُ which basically is a poem attributed to Hassan al-Basri that mentions like these incredible virtues of the Qur'an, intercession for one's family, that it will draw a person nearer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and so on and so forth. And that's why in our academic tradition, you find 40 hadith on the virtues of the Qur'an. Usually when something has so many virtues, you'll find scholars will collect 40 hadith to amplify for us how we should pay attention to the book of Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the Qur'an also warns us of neglecting the Qur'an. We find in Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does this in a very caring way. He doesn't just attack us. He tells us about the people who preceded us. وَمِنْهُمْ أُمِّيُّونَ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ الْكِتَابَ إِلَّا أَمَانِيَّ وَإِنْهُمْ إِلَّا يَظُنُّونَ Allah SWT says in the 57th verse of Surah Al-Baqarah, I believe, that from amongst them, the followers of Musa are أُمِّيُّون, illiterate people. لَا يَعْلَمُونَ الْكِتَابَ They don't know their book. إِلَّا أَمَانِيَّ And أَمَانِيَّ means a tilawa. The only thing that they know of their book is how to recite it nice. Does that sound familiar? And Abdullah ibn Mas'ud warned us. He said, there will come a time when the scholars are many and the fuqaha are many. But then there will come a time when the speakers are many and the reciters are many, but the fuqaha are less. The people of knowledge will be less. In the early days, people of knowledge are a lot and the reciters are less. But later on, the reciters will be a lot and the speakers will be a lot because charisma doesn't need academic qualifications. Just ask the people who followed Samiri. And the reciters will be a lot. 
So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is warning us through this verse not to neglect the deeper meanings that are associated with the Qur'an, nor should we ne neglect its tilawa, which is important, but the word tilawa means to follow. Wal-qamari idha talaha, from tilawa, the moon follows the sun. So the one who makes tilawa of the Qur'an, they follow the Qur'an with their actions. It's a higher level of thinking. So Allah mentions that this community was one that had no knowledge, they were ignorant people, except they knew how to recite the Torah nicely. They were good at that. Imam al-Shatibi, rahimahullah, and Hirz al-Amani, this is one book we learned some time ago here. He says, فَحَبْلُ اللَّهِ فِينَا كِتَابُهُ فَجَاهِدْ بِهِ حِبْلَ الْعِدَى مُتَحَبِّلًا He locates our relationship with the Qur'an, and by the way, al-Shatibi, he was blind, subhanAllah. He wrote a thousand line poem on all the qira'at and the furush. And he was blind. He was inspired by the Qur'an. So he said, فَجَاهِدْ بِهِ حِبْلَ الْمُتَحَبِّلَ That you should make jihad in your relationship with the Qur'an. فَلَا تُطِيعُ الْكَافِرِينَ وَجَاهِدْ بِهِ جِهَادًا كَبِيرًا Allah says, don't obey the disbelievers and fight with it, and it is the Qur'an. Jihadan kabira, a great struggle. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to Sayyidina Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, inna sanuqi alayka qawlan taqila. We sent to you a very heavy speech. And then Allah locates the relationship of the Qur'an and engaging in a restorative theology and a life-giving source in Naraka fin Nahari Sabahan Tawila. There's a different qira'ah, not from the tin. In Naraka fin Nahari Sabahan Tawila. Sabaha means you're going to be torn to pieces. The day will rip you to pieces. So, what is going to keep you whole? Al Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to Sayyidina Yahya, Khud al Kitaba bi quwa. Was Sayyidina Yahya, he had Isma. Sayyidina Yahya, Allah protected him from sins. Sayyidina Sheikh Al Ahmad Al Marzuki, he says about the Prophets, Ismatum kasai il malaika wa jibatum wa fadalu malaika. The Prophets are like angels, they don't commit sins, according to the majority of Ahl Sunnah. But even though they have their ma'asum, what does Allah tell them? Khud al kitaba bi quwa. Hold on to the book of strength. Allah says to Sayyidina Musa, cling to it. If that's the case of people that Allah has protected, what about you and me? In the wild and noble kingdom of the West. If that's the relationship those prophets had with their books, and Allah, Wallahu ya'asimuka minan nas, Allah protected them. What about us here? We don't have that kind of protection. We just have a takalluf. That's why Al-Busti, the great Afghan, he said, وَاشْتُدْ يَدَيْكَ بِحَبْلِ اللَّهِ مُعْتَصِمًا فِإِنَّهُ الرُّؤْنُ خَانَتْكَ أَرْكَانُ You should cling to the book of Allah. It's the only anchor you will have when everything dis like disintegrates and you don't have it anymore. And that's why the Prophet وسلم, in a sound narration, he said, that the book of Allah is the rope of Allah, the Quran is the rope of Allah extending from the heavens. In another narration, which is also authentic, he said, that one side of this rope is being maintained by Allah. And one side of it is maintained, maintained by the Ummah of Sayyidina Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So we're commanded, each and every one of us, to jahid with the Qur'an. The word jahid implies that there will be opposition in ourselves, in our mind, our society, people around us, waswas, -was, shaitan, insecurities, bad teachers, difficulties in life. There will be some kind of adversity that comes to having a relationship with the Qur'an. What are 
some of the outcomes of neglecting a deeper relationship with the Qur'an beyond amaniya, just recitation. Recitation is important. I, I still read to my teachers. I still read to them. If I can't read to them, recently I had to record the riwayah of Ibn Kathir from, from Al-Bazi. He told me, Sajid, just record it, I'm busy, send it to me. So tilawa, by no means am I trying to uh, you know, devalue the place of recitation. But recitation that does not lead to natija is a problem. Reading without it leading somewhere. And the Prophet وسلم, he said, Al Quran hujjatulak al alaik. The Quran will be for you or against you. He's not talking about tilawa to Quran. He's talking about translating the tilawa into action. So what are some of the, the symptoms we see now? of this attitude that we may have inadvertently adopted towards the Qur'an and being satisfied with baraka and not haraka. As our shaykh, shaykhina, Dr. Yusuf al-Qaradawi, who recently passed away, used to talk about. The first, and I wrote this in Arabic, sorry. Ashakku fi masadr al-deen wa turathina wa man sabaquna bil iman. The first sign that we don't have a strong relationship with the Qur'an, we saw this now recently in America, is doubt in the sources of Sharia. It's impossible to imagine anyone would have any issue with the Qur'an's preservation five years ago, six years ago. But now we see this, and these are the same arguments that people presented even in the early times of Islam. As one of our teachers used to say to us, Sheikh Abdul Basit Hashim, who was blind, mashallah, great scholar of Quran, who passed away of COVID, rahimahullah. You know, he said, like, these are the same arguments. But the hearts of the ummah are different than the hearts of that ummah. That's why Shah Tabi says, وَمَا لِلْقُرْآنِ وَمَا لِلْقِيَاسِ فِي الْقُرْآنِ مُدْخَلَ That there's no qiyas. We heard people saying, some people made ijtihad, some of the early imams made ijtihad, you know, it's not yakfurun, uh, it's nakfur, this, 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 this. This has already been dealt with by those righteous people who were closer to the time of the Prophet than us and who wrote extensively about this. So there's no qiyas in tadween al-Qur'an. Fadunaka ma fihi rida mukafila. And say to Shatib, he says, so just stay with, be with Allah. Don't get caught up. So doubt in the Qur'an, the preservation of the Qur'an, the qira'at. SubhanAllah, people, one day a man, he came to me. He said, I want to ask you about the qira'at. I said, read Al-Fatiha. He said, I don't know how to read Al-Fatiha. Why do you want to argue about the qira'at? If you don't have the fatih, how can you enter the door? And then, of course, with the collection of the sunnah of the Prophet wasallam, And then the turath. We're so brutal on our own turath. In the last four weeks, everyone became a gender studies major in Iran. But no one said nothing about how the brutal sanctions from this country killed more women than anyone else can imagine. You know why? Because we love these white people. We love to be slave to these white people. So we will say what makes them happy. You know why? Because we pulled away from the Quran. That's the symptom of a post-colonial community. It doesn't mean that we're not critical of what happened in Iran, of course. But look at the, the, the bravado that we had. We didn't say anything when women there didn't have access to COVID vaccines. Or the women in Yemen who don't even have bread. But we became enamored by what they told us what was important, so we bought into it. And the same thing impacts how we look at our religion. The attitude that we have is oftentimes furnished by modernity, social media, and post-colonialism. I'll give you a proof. Argue about atheism without science. You know we can't do that? Because our minds are colonized. But look at Ar-Razi, how he argued without science. And he used science when he needed to. So the, the first symptom is a doubt in the foundational systems of Sharia. Quran, Sunnah, our academic tradition 
as well as the Muslims who came before us, where the opposite is in the Quran. وَالَّذِينَ جَاءُوا مِنْ بَعْدِهِمْ يَقُولُونَ رَبَّنَا اغْفِرْ لَنَا وَلِإِخْوَانِنَا الَّذِينَ سَبَقُونَ بِالْإِيمَانِ Allah forgive us and those who came before us. And that's due, we're going to cause two very serious issues when we start to have doubt in these things. Number one is cognitive doubts. Number two are desires. Because when my, my, my cognitive commitment to something wavers, then the door of shahawat opens. Because my cognitive commitment is a symptom of yaqeen, a symptom of sincerity and certainty. And that certainty is going to allow me to commit to the ahkam. Ana la uhkim ala kitab wa sunnah, ahtakim al kitab wa sunnah. I don't, I don't rule on the Quran and Sunnah, I'm ruled by the Quran and Sunnah. And that, that attitude is in opposition to transmodernity and everything that you find. But if somebody's busy weighing themselves in Instagrams and they wonder why they feel like they're wasting time always on tick tock, and they're always fighting with people because they're on discord, then you have to wonder about the source material of how they see their religion. As Sheikh Sha'rawi used to say, Alayna an tadayyin al asra, la natasara tadayyun. We don't mold our religion by the world around us, we mold the world by the lens of the Book of Allah. But if we doubt the foundations of the deen, and that's one of the goals of transmodernity, is to decentralize, abruptly wreck things. So that there's no religious references. And then we became like the people said, Humfi Amir Marij. They're mixed up. There's going to be some good messages too, sorry. The second, Al Haya Munfasra an al Akhira. The second symptom of being away from the Quran is that a life is not centered around the hereafter. But the hereafter is mentioned on almost every page of the Quran. Imam Ibn Taymiyyah said, you will not find a page of the Qur'an except the Akhirah is mentioned there. To center us, it's the opposite of social media. You will not find a post except the dunya is amplified, its permanence is imparted on you, and then you are forced to adapt your life to someone that has more filters than you can imagine. And when you go on social media, I want you to understand something. You are like the people watching the magicians with Musa. The eyes are deceived. And the algorithms that you're going up against, it is literally like a tsunami of enemies of your soul. I'm not saying give up on social media. I'm saying don't be naive though. Don't allow it to again become an extension of colonialism whose incentive is capitalizing everything around us. So the second, is a life divorced from the hereafter, not centered in living for the hereafter. We don't, we don't live, we don't die to live, right? We, we live to die. That's very different. We, we, we believe that after death is something else. So we don't die to live, we live to die. Alladhi khalaq al mawta, Ibn Abbas said, mawta is dunya. وَالْحَيَاءَ is al akhira The opposite of everything around us now. So what I'm furnishing my life with, and again, don't get extreme and go start breaking phones and closing accounts. and That's not what we're talking about because we're going to get to that in a minute, inshallah, if I have time. The third is قُلُوب مُنْقَطِعَانِ الْعِبَادَةِ وَالدَّعْوَةِ is hearts divorced from worship and ibadah. Now most of the people when they ask fatwa, it's can I do this? Can I get around this? Is there some kind of dispensation for me? There's places for that. But very rarely do you find people asking about wara. To be cautious. To be safe. To put the hereafter in front of everything. And that's what happens when we pull away from the Quran. We forget what Imam Al-Ghazali rahimahullah said, thamaratul hayya. Ibadah. The fruit of living a meaningful life is worship and ubudiyah and being a servant to Allah. The more I see the world, the more I realize laha rabb, it has a Lord. And that Lord has commanded me to be a khadim, to 
to be a servant to him. And the second, da'wah. You know how you know Muslims are making da'wah like we used to? Where's the suhaibs? Serious question. The one who will replace me when I'm gone. Those old people that we always make fun of, the ammos and the aunties and the khalas and the chachas, I respect them. You know I respect them? Because we always used to complain. They don't have the cultural competency. We use them big words. They don't have the cultural competency to address the perception gaps between their world and America. <laughs> I'm wearing hemp kufis and a vegan thobe. And I love Andrew Tate because I'm going to be the greatest husband ever. Right. That's where we are. So we're making fun of the elders. But you know them elders, man? They were in the streets. I am the product of those chachas and chachis, bro. So they may not have been able to know the difference between things that you and I may have been subjected to because we were born in this country. Thoreau said that geography is providence. But I remember one time I went to visit Imam Siraj Wahaj in Brooklyn. This is before I lived in New York. And subhanAllah, it was on a Sunday afternoon and they were making jawla. Jawla to the non-Muslims in the projects. And there was one old chacha sahib in a white shawar kameez. You know, with the, you know, when they got the lean, they've been around and the gravity is calling them back to God, bro. <laughs> Those kind of people that you just kiss their head when you see them. You see a life of worship in their eyes. And I went to him. I said, Salaam alaikum, please make dua for me. He said, are you going to come with us? I said, whoa, 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 what? He said, he, said, he said, every Sunday for 45 years, I go to the projects, I call people to Allah. And he told me, my English isn't good. But Imam Siraj said, but your heart is alive. So now we see younger generations of Muslims, you know the greatest symptom that we're not making da'wah? We, we started fighting each other. We have the bandwidth to fight and argue. Instead of and we see some young people, mashallah, on TikTok and Instagram, mashallah, using their platform, they're trying. May Allah increase that work. But it's not like it used to be. Something changed. Because when I divorced from the hereafter and divorced myself from the foundations of Sharia, I won't understand the major goal. Imam Ibn Hajr al Haythami, not al Sqalani, in Fatwa al Kubra. He said that people should live in the lands of non-Muslims if they can worship and experience dignity because they will call people to the haqq. The last, and I'm trying to look at a time stamp or something, is confusing ibda' what ibtida'. When we pull away from the Qur'an, we confuse bid'ah with innovation. We became worried. But the Qur'an teaches us that the foundation is exploration. The Qur'an teaches us that the foundation is to engage the world around us. Allah created everything for you. Traverse the earth and eat of its food. Hang out and see what's going on in the dunya. Allah says, I made you to know each other. So we've confused heterodoxy and our approach to things is, and no disrespect to the Hanafis, al fil asha tahrim. That the foundation of everything is forbidden. But the Quran teaches us no. That the foundation, that's why it says hurrimat alaykum. Why hurrimat? It was made haram for you. Because before it was made haram for you, its default was what? It was permissible. Look at the attitude we should have. But now, Shaykh, is, is Bitcoin haram? That's not the question. Is Bitcoin halal? It's understood to be halal. You have to prove it's haram. It's going to the school, halal. It's understood to be halal. You have to prove it's haram. We've inverted the attitude that the early generations have, scholars of usul, that everything around us is permissible unless there is a clear text or an ijma, or if you make taqlid of a madhab from your imam or who you ask questions of, that says it's forbidden. 
What happened to us? A few other points, and I need to finish my apologies. Is istislam lil asr bi il fahim an al qadr? Surrendering to an age because of a bad understanding of qadr. So we find like bad things happen to people. This summer for me was crazy. COVID, almost died. Wife lost 2.3 liters of blood, giving birth. I looked up, she was whiter than me. I said, what's wrong? She said, I don't feel well. Then I heard the doctor say the H word, and mothers, God bless you. Hemorrhage. When you hear that as a husband, you just got to start performing, man. Read Yasin, leave it to Allah. Alhamdulillah, everything came out okay. It was scary. But sometimes these things happen, and we're like, God hates me. First of all, I ain't that important. The ummah is so bad. Everything's wrong. Wallahi subhanAllah, read the books of Sadat al Asha'ira, with Sadat Ahl Kalam, with Sadat al Hanabila, with Athariya, Usul al Deen. We have to study Usul al Deen that teach us there's a difference between the Qada of Allah and the Amr of Allah. And the Qada of Allah and the Amr of Allah can be different. Allah has decreed. Such and such person will be a disbeliever. But he has commanded us all to believe. What are we going to do about it? One of our teachers used to say, Sheikh Hubaysh rahimahullah. Allah SWT commanded everyone to believe, but he decreed that Abu Lahab would be kafir. So what do we do? Sheikh Ahmad Dardir, he says, as Sayyidina Umar al-Khattab beautifully says here, and this is a mind that the Quran is building. He says, Rahimahullah, الرجل الذي يحارب القدر بالقدر أحب إلى الله. The person who fights قدر with قدر is beloved to Allah. What does he mean? That if I see something wrong around me, I don't, I don't surrender to the world. I don't surrender to the qada as I see it. I remember what Allah has commanded me. And for those of you in tasawwuf, this is the highest essence of ihsan. Not sitting at home and burning oud and telling yourself how cool you are. <laughs> That's why the greatest leaders of jihad were the people of tasawwuf. Sayyidina Imam Ibn Ashur, Sahib al Manzuma, Murshid al Mu'in, he and his son died fighting the French. Imam Ibn Juzay, he died fighting. These were people at the head of fiqh and tasawwuf and ilm. So here we should be at the forefront of justice without sacrificing our principles, not cowering in the face of evil. In LA, you have a history of this, mashallah, a thought of magazine, UCLA. I remember my day, in my day, mashallah, still to this day, doing great work to amplify things. So if the command is different than the qada, this is what it means to worship Allah as though you see him, even though you can't see him. This is the essence of Islam, and this is how we should teach aqidah to our children. So then it's not, why is everything going wrong? Everything going wrong is an opportunity for a muhsin. It's a chance for me to cash in. The greater the fitna, the greater the opportunity. The greater the kufr, the greater the iman. The greater the rejection, the greater tamasuk. The more ghafla, the more I'm woke. That's the foundation of the Quran. We're going to test you with good and evil. But if I worship Allah as though I see Allah even though I can't see Him, what does it mean? As one of my teachers told me. You worship Allah as though you see He's telling you right now, don't do this, do this, don't do this. So I stick to the hukum, which is stable in the face of an unstable world. That comes from having a relationship with the Quran. If they rejected you, don't worry, O Muhammad, they rejected people before you. No problem. As the brother read, just stay focused. فَاسْتَقِمْ كَمَا أُمِرْتْ So uh, in a mind and a heart that is away from the Qur'an will find itself being pressured and shaped and pushed by 
the world around you. Finally, al-ifrat wa tafrit between two extremes, irrational liberalism and irresponsible conservatism. And what this leads to is a vacuum. And this goes back to what I said in the very beginning, not having thiqa with the masadir of, of sharia, not having a strong belief in the preservation of the Qur'an. وَمَا لِلْقِيَاسِ فِي الْقُرْآنِ مَدْخُلُ مَدْخَلَ As Sayyidina Shatabi says in his Al-Amani, there's no qiyas in the tadween of the Qur'an. This was started by the Mu'tazilites. Why? Because they wanted to defend their belief. So they specifically, not to get too technical, attacked the qira'ah of Abu Amr al-Basri, rahimahullah. It started with them. And then it was taken by, of course, the academy. And the academy has amplified this Western academy, not the Muslim academy. And what does that lead to? A vacuum. So now we find political nomenclature replacing religious nomenclature. We find, excuse me, political jargon replacing, replacing religious jargon. So it was called student loan forgiveness. What? Student loan forgiveness? Forgiveness is, is something else. And we find Muslims in America with a lack of having a strong base and trust in the preservation of the Qur'an are going to fall for the rhetoric of the left or the right. But I got news for you. We're a prophetic community, not a political community. We are a prophetic community that engages politics at times when it is in the best interest of our hereafter. And if the right has a problem with Muslims, the left has a problem with Islam. So now what are you going to do? That doesn't mean that we abandon cooperation and looking for strategic relationships, as, I'm going to talk, as I talked about earlier. How we engage the dunya is one of strategic relationships. But look how we are. No community in America has been mistreated like us at every level. We can still be the blunt of jokes and nobody will do anything. Politically, socially, financially, culturally. But we walk into rooms and we'll say, you know, I'm here to work, but I don't put my community first. We're the only community that will say that. Me and my company, I purposely hire people from Palestine in Gaza, because I know how strategically important that is. I purposely tried to hire people in Yemen until America made bombs were dropped on them by the leader of the two harams and other people, Iran and the UAE, Muslim countries. I believe Muslim first, absolutely. And I believe that if I live Muslim first, that's going to benefit the rest of the world because that's going to bring justice and happiness and khair. But we're so defeated that we will actually tell people, yeah, you know, we put our community in the back. We're here for you guys. As though everything is great. Six years ago, people in Arizona surrounded mosques with guns. Did you forget that? And now you want to kiss up to the right? The right needs to make toba before you can make it right with them. The left tries to impose upon us their ideas of sexual ethics, and they say we're tolerant. The most intolerant person I've ever seen is someone on the left when you don't agree with them. So then what are you going to do? And I understand some people get, get mad at me. You know why you get mad at me? Because the base is political theology or political nomenclature. But if you know I'm Muslim and you're Muslim, like, okay, cool, whatever, good. He's talking whatever he wants to talk. I don't have to agree with him. Salaam alaikum, brother. Not, oh, man, I'm unfollowing that guy. I'm going to write an article. I hate that dude. You know, in Islam, we don't have cancel culture. We have redemption opportunity. You don't believe me? Ask Malcolm. You don't believe me? Apply the right or left cancel culture to any of the Sahaba, they would have been canceled. Omar ibn Khattab, out. The family of the Prophet, alayhim salam, Oh, because of their proximity to the Prophet, this is like unfair, they've got to go. Sayyidina Bilal, he's an immigrant, he's a black man, this right-leaning, no, can't have that. Who would have been left? Maybe Salman al-Farsi. So that shows you that that thinking 
is not religious. It's political, it's secular, it's brutal, it's harsh, it's unforgiving. But what does Allah say to Abu Sufyan and his wife? If they repent and they do what they're supposed to do, they are now Muslim. There's responsibility and accountability, but the door of redemption is not shut for them. That's Quranic. And that's what I like to tell people. Being deceived by the tolerance of the dunya makes people more intolerant. But falling in love with the tolerance of religion, wallahi, you can turn mountains into silly putty, man. I'm proof of that. I'll finish here because we have other mashaykh and shaykhat, alhamdulillah. But one of the points I was talking about also is when we distance ourselves from the Qur'an, there is a confusion between a taqdis, taqdis al-ashkhas, living vicariously through people, religious people, giving them more superpowers than they should have. Taqdis al-ashkhas wa taqlil al-ishtihad. Blindly following, no longer making ishtihad. Subhanallah, you know, the greatest students of Abu Hanifa, all of you know who they were, sahiban. One of them, he wrote a book about taxes, Abu Yusuf, Al-Kharaj. The other one, he wrote a book about Al-Alaq al international relations. And at their time, those two were the most important books in the subject, even though they were fuqaha. They were inspired not to preserve a tradition just for the sake of preserving it, but to preserve it so that it can inspire a new tradition that would be linked to that tradition and would continue the light of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I'll finish by saying, where should you start so that you can stand alone? I know I said a lot. Number one is you should address your doubts. Address your doubts you have about the Qur'an. It should be an opportunity to ask questions, to engage. There's nothing wrong with that. When I started teaching tafsir at NYU, students used to say, sorry, sorry, sorry. Then why are you sorry? I have a question. Why are you sorry for asking the question? Who, who taught you this way? So then finally I said, every time you say sorry, you have to give $5 to Islamic Relief. And you know, students, after that, mashallah. <laughs> Number two, you should emancipate yourself. And I want you to listen to this. By striving for awareness instead of amplified guilt. That's what we do. We amplify our guilt instead of trying to strive for awareness of why do I feel this way? Not, I feel this way, why? And then I'm able to uncover some of the layers because there are people that have had traumatic experiences with Qur'an, Qur'anic teachers. That's a reality that exists in our community that has to be addressed as a therapeutic issue that has to be touched on so that people can heal restorative theology instead of amplified guilt. Read it daily for learning and blessings. Take it in doses. Have a teacher. Have someone who learned the Qur'an correctly teach you. Wallahi, everyone here that did it will tell you that no matter what we learn, no matter what we learned, our greatest experience was who taught us Qur'an. Wallahi, even some of our Qur'an teachers, maybe we learn more than them actually. But when we see them, you wouldn't know that. We treat them like kings. We treat them like queens. So have a shaykh. I remember I went to my teacher in Oklahoma. He said, I'm busy, I'm busy, I'm busy. He's from Senegal. I, I, I was young. I said, if you don't teach me, I will hold you in front of Allah. <laughs> and you know what he said? Grab a pen and paper. <laughs> don't let anyone invoke gender, race, language, new Muslim, old Muslim, as a means to intimidate you. This is from Bab al-Shaytan. Everyone should have a relationship with the book of Allah and a shaykh who can teach. And that's why you have to invest in things like miftah and scholars like Sheikh Haifa so that you can scale religious teachings. The last few points. Understand that the Qur'an's enemies are your enemies. Just remember that. An enemy to the Qur'an is an enemy to you. An enemy to Sayyidina Muhammad is an enemy to you. Aim realistically, but have high goals. Start small, go slowly. And finally, watch what you watch. I'm going to finish with this. You have to be very careful, and forgive me, Sheikh, for what you put in your head. Anyone know about TikTok in China? 
You know TikTok in China, if you're under 14, you can only watch it from 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. and then it's shut off. You only have 40 minutes a day as a 14-year-old or younger to look at TikTok in China. You know what else happens in China? I'm not encouraging us to be like the Chinese, of course, government. But this is food for thought. Because in the China algorithm, because when you go online, you are facing an algorithm. You are in the octagon. It's like Conor McGregor versus Khabib, man. It's a wrap. It's like the Lakers versus the Celtics. It's a wrap. Right? Sorry, I had to do it. it I set it up. It was just, pow. Don't talk about my coach. He's not Muslim. <laughs> make Tawbah, inshallah. But when you go online, the algorithm that you face, you should listen to a very important podcast. It's very important. Called Amusing Ourselves to Death. It goes to all the algorithms that have been placed just for you. And none of it wants to take you to Jannah. At least be aware of it. In China, you know what they show on TikTok? People trying to solve nuclear fission. Mathematic scholars. Doctors. I'm serious. People that have multiple skills in language. So they did a study recently of Generation Z in China. And they asked them, what do you want to be? The number one answer was what? A mathematician. A doctor. They did it in America. The number one answer was an influencer. <laughs> it's not funny, though, because they're killing our kids, man. And they asked them, what is one of the greatest things you can accomplish? They said, putting menthols in a Diet Coke bottle and making it explode. <laughs> Someone that's exposed to that, you're laughing, but you should be crying. Someone that is exposed, and that's why Islamic schools are Fard. And what Miftah does is Fard. Kifaya. Wa qad yakun Fard'ain. What Alam does is Fard. Sheikh Ahifad. These educators, this stuff is important. Because if we don't sanitize our minds and hearts, some of the things that I talked about that we see are symptomatic in our community will come our way. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you and increase you in khair. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us a relationship with his book. Barakallahu feekum. As-salamu alaykum.